colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, citizens, citizenesses. I want to welcome you to the University of uh, Sydney. Uh, my name is uh, John Key. I'm Professor of Politics uh, here at the University. I also helped to found and to run the Sydney Democracy Network, which is a co-host uh, with uh, Australia's For War Powers Reform tonight of this uh, event. SDM is uh, a network, the first uh, ever in Australia, uh, and still the only network of associates and partner organizations of scholars and journalists and activists who are concerned about the current um, state of democracy in Australia and elsewhere. Um, some of you will know that uh, the joke has been circulating that we're beginning to operate as if we're in a funeral parlor, so many bodies coming in from all over the place. Um, I want to acknowledge that we uh, meet on the lands of the Gadigal people who have lived on these lands for some 40,000 years, whose land this remains and forever shall. I want to acknowledge uh, their elders past and present, and I would like to acknowledge as well um, the peoples of uh, the Gadigal Nation and others, indigenous people who live in this part of the city that is now called uh, Sydney. I want to thank um, the um, Australians for War Powers Reform group with whom we've uh, worked tonight to uh, host this event. You know that the subject, uh, which is um, not altogether a pretty subject, is war and democracy. Everybody who approaches this subject knows the famous words of Shelley uh, in Queen Man. War, Shelley wrote, is the statesman's gain, the priest's delight, the lawyer's jest, the hired assassin's trade. The poetry is beautiful, but the politics is not quite right because, among other things, it leaves out citizens from that equation. Beginning with the Greeks, all democracies have featured citizens in the dirty, often dirty business of war uh, and declarations and prosecutions of war. Citizens, as you know, have been uh, participators in military uh, actions. Think of, uh, as well, during World War II, the striking figure that some 85 million Americans actually purchased war bonds that brought the government 185 uh, billion uh, dollars. Our inherited conceptions of citizenship are marked by war. Uh, the citizen always historically rode on horseback. The right to bear arms, of course, a masculine right, was always uh, in very many contexts seen as the key to uh, enfranchisement. How is it today that war and democracy is placed? What are the trends that uh, are the background, so to say, against which this public forum uh, is being held. I want to uh, mention a small handful of these trends because I hope they will feed into uh, tonight's uh, discussions. These uh, new threatening trends uh, include the following. The, there is a new prescience to the old dilemma of whether democracies intervene in uh, conflicts in which um, terror and um, violence and the destruction of civilian life happens. All democracies are faced uh, typically with a dilemma. If they intervene, as for example India did in Bangladesh in 1971, as uh, the United States has repeatedly done since Mexico in the 1840s, then they're accused of meddling. They're accused of violating sovereignty and those uh, principles. They're accused of double standards. And yet, if democracies don't intervene, uh, for example in Ukraine or Syria or Rwanda or Palestine, uh, then they are accused of exactly the same thing. They're accused of hypocrisy, of avoiding their responsibility to protect people. Um, they're accused of turning a blind eye to cruelty. This is uh, an old dilemma that has, I think, a new prescience, and Syria has brought that, uh, made that uh, point very clear. There is a second trend. Um, we could say that the Korean Peninsula drama that's going on at the moment reminds us that um, we live in an age of intensifying state rivalries. 
Um, all of these rivalries are fueled by arms sales. You'll know that four out of five of the member states of the UN Security Council supply nearly 80% of the world's arms trade. You could be forgiven for thinking that the UN Security Council is actually an arms trade arrangement. Um, and we are witnessing massive increases of military spending. You'll know that the US Senate just recently passed its version of a 700 billion US dollar military spending bill, so backing Trump's call for a bigger, stronger military. There's a third trend which is very strange and in the history of democracy is unprecedented, and that's the robotization of war. The United States uh, has been the leader, as you know. It has uh, more than 7,000 so-called unmanned aerial systems, popularly called drones. Um, this has brought destruction to um, more than a handful of countries, and um, it has led to loss of life. In Afghanistan alone this year, more than 2,300 strikes have happened, and over 1,000 people reportedly killed. Um, all of this, of course, robotization of war breaks the connection between citizenship and democracy and war. Um, and uh, this could help explain why the United States doesn't declare war anymore. In fact, the last time uh, this empire declared war was in 1942 against Bulgaria, Hungary, and uh, Romania. Uh, we could talk about, and I hope we will tonight, the constitutional arrangements in the United States, but the, the clear pattern is that with the robotization of war, um, Congress is no longer, has not been involved in the development of that program for the prosecution of that program, and even efforts uh, in the courts, for example, in the Federal Appeals Court by uh, Faisal bin Ali Daba to uh, get compensation for the wrongful death of his family, even those efforts have uh, failed. There's a fourth trend. If you're not already uh, concerned, this fourth trend is certainly uh, should be of concern to any small D Democrat, and it is the growth of private armies and so-called contract warfare. They're spreading. You may uh, know that the military interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq were actually heavily dependent, around 50%, on so-called uh, contractors. And if you think about this trend, it's beginning to look as if Machiavelli's condottieri, you know, private armies, is beginning to be the way that war is prosecuted uh, by uh, the most powerful states on the earth. And then finally, um, there is a blowback uh, into civil societies of every actually existing democracy uh, because of these uh, trends. This is uh, known as the war uh, against terror. But it is, as you all know well, it's leading to trends in which security measures are applied to increasing numbers of institutions and in which so-called terrorists uh, 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 extract revenge on civilian populations. Uh, this in turn feeds the harvesting and total surveillance of citizens and so on. And all of these trends are very clearly the militarization of societies uh, in this permanent war uh, should be worried to every democracy. There are other uh, trends. Um, one thing I think that's very striking when you begin to look in detail at the problem of war and democracy is the growing trend towards arbitrary power, the trend towards um, increasing executive power uh, that is exercised in uh, secrecy. You can see this in the so-called khaki uh, mercantilist regimes of our region. You can also see this uh, in the growing in invisibility of the small arms trade and in Australia's, for example, implication uh, through Pine Gap in uh, drone strikes in Pakistan and Syria, Yemen, Somalia and Afghanistan. All of this raises the question of what democracies can do about these trends. Um, some democracies, as you know, have parliamentary legislative control over such uh, war-making powers. Even the United Kingdom during the Gordon Brown um, uh, government uh, transferred some of these powers to declare war, to ratify treaties from the executive to parliament. I hope tonight we'll have a discussion about the parlous state of um, Australian procedures when it comes to this. I understand from speaking to Paul, who is one of our speakers tonight, that it was only in 1942 that um, the uh, cabinet, actually the attorney general, no, the governor general, um, became uh, the rightful 
um, uh, the rightful uh, owner, so to say, of the power uh, of war powers. We should discuss it tonight. To talk about these trends, we have three very distinguished speakers, and I'm delighted to welcome them to the university. Um, Emeritus Professor Gillian Treat. Um, Gillian, I'd like to welcome you back to the university. We all followed you uh, intensely during uh, your period as Australian Human Rights um, Commission President between 2012 and 2017, and I have no doubt that you became even more um, publicly famous and your reputation for courage uh, under great pressure uh, rose during this period. Uh, you may know everybody that put in the You may know that Gillian was uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law and uh, Charles Professor of International Law at the University. She should also receive a clap for that. <laughs> um, a former barrister and now, uh, of course, uh, a much loved and respected uh, public figure. I want to welcome as well Paul Barrett, um, who is President of the Australian for War Powers Reform. Uh, he's a former secretary of the Department of Defense who had, uh, he told me earlier tonight, the senior responsibility for Australia's uh, intervention in uh, East Timor. He knows what he is talking about. Um, and I'm also, uh, since um, the first two speakers are presidents, I'd like to announce that Kelly Tranter is president. Uh, let's say, let's say, president of public life. Um, <laughs> Kelly uh, is a prominent lawyer, an activist. Uh, she has run for the Senate uh, with the WikiLeaks party, and she's been an independent candidate for the New South Wales Parliament as well. Um, she's an active contributor to media here, publishing, for example, on and uh, through the ABC, the National Times. Uh, that knew Matilda and has appeared for the Australian, Insti Australian Institute and is um, centrally concerned with the problem of war. Uh, the procedure tonight is straightforward. Uh, Gillian is going to begin. Um, each speaker will speak for up to 20 minutes uh, from the podium and then we'll have Q&A. Thank you very much. very much indeed for um, having me back to the University of, um, of Sydney. I was rather disappointed actually as I came through the quadrangle to realise the jacaranda tree is gone, but I think there's a new one planted, so uh, hopefully that will bring that beautiful bloom that always reminds us that the exams are on the way. <laughs> it always terrified me. Um, John has actually very kindly introduced me and introduced me indeed as an emeritus professor uh, of international law, which, uh, which I am from the University of Sydney. I'm very grateful for it. Uh, but I was introduced uh, uh, a few weeks ago as my term as the President of the Human Rights Commission came to an end as Emeritus Professor Julian Triggs, Emeritus being Latin for has been. Well, <laughs> I'm not quite a has been. And one of the nice things uh, about having finished that position is that I'm, I've now got the, the luxury to move on to some areas that um, really do interest me as a public international lawyer and where I hope that I can add something to the debate uh, and discussion tonight. It's a huge pleasure uh, for me to be with Paul and, and, and Kelly and John and, and to be with all of you. So, um, but let me begin then by, by, by just reminding us of, of where we are today. Um, the recent announcement by the, uh, the Foreign Minister uh, of military assistance to the Philippine government in combating the so-called Muslim uh, insurgency in Mindanao has raised yet again the wisdom of maintaining the almost unchecked power of Australia's executive government to authorise military engagements. The agreement to provide President Duterte with SAS units to advise and to assist, along with providing two AP-3C Orion uh, surveillance aircraft, uh, those decisions have been made in the absence of any form of transparency or federal parliamentary consultation. There's been almost no explanation as to why, after decades of separatist fighting in Mindanao, military assistance is now given to the president, who has notoriously ordered the extrajudicial executions of thousands of his own citizens in a war against drugs. He suspended habeas corpus, uh, and he's, um, uh, he's uh, 
he's uh, basically suspended the rule of law uh, in, uh, in throughout the throughout the area in the southern southern of the Philippines. There is, of course, nothing unusual about the unilateral decision by respective Australian governments to deploy armed forces or to provide some form of military assistance in international conflicts. Over many decades, our Prime Ministers have announced such engagements only subsequently to inform Parliament. Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. Australia has a long-standing military support for the Syrian bombing campaign and continued deployment of military personnel in Iraq with little or no public discussion or parliamentary debate. Well, with this uh, informed audience, I won't revisit the constitutional questions of the defence power nor its purpose of uh, interpretation by the High Court, other than to observe the troubling fact that the power to make war is an almost unconstrained exec executive function in which Parliament has no formal role. A situation that I believe is out of step with contemporary practice of contemporary of, of other comparable governments and with the principles of the rule of law and good governance generally. Well, what can I add to a, a discussion such as this about the reform of Australia's law powers? My perspective on this issue is informed by my uh, career as a, as a public international lawyer, but most especially as President of the Australian Human Rights Commission over the last five years. It's become clear to me that quite apart from the defence power itself, the federal executive has expanded significantly over the last 10 to 15 years, not only to the detriment of, of parliamentary processes, but to the detriment of the independence of the judiciary and the separation of powers among the three branches of representative democracy. With each new piece of legislation, we have found the federal executive augments its discretionary power with little resistance from Parliament, the courts, or the public. Examples include, of course, the, in my view, disproportionate counter-terrorist legislation, the rise of non-compellable and non-reviewable ministerial discretions, the use of control orders, the implementation of laws for the retention of metadata and indeed the access to metadata laws or the, to metadata information. The uh, cancellation of citizenship where there's a dual citizenship and visa cancellations on character grounds leading to rising numbers of people in mandatory uh, detention in our detention centres. Laws to arrest bikies, to detain sex offenders and violent offenders all without trial and, of course, the continued use of mandatory detention without trial and offshore processing. In all of these ways, the federal executive augments these powers with very little control by the courts for very particular Australian reasons of exceptionalism and isolation from the principles of the rule of law, of international law, and of human rights law generally. The executive overreach through disproportionate laws has been largely <coughs> unremarked even by the media, allowing respective governments to assume virtually untrammeled, untrammeled discretion in dealing with alleged risks to national security. In stating my concerns about the executive war powers, you might reasonably, however, point out that the power of the executive is always subject to the will of Parliament and ultimately to the ballot box. Under the Westminster system, if members of Parliament are unhappy with the unilateral decision of the government of the day, the Prime Minister and the Ministers are subject to scrutiny at question time, and the government may be subject to a motion of no confidence. In short, perhaps one should not exaggerate the dangers to democracy and executive war powers because the checks and the balances are in place. Well, I re respectfully contest that sanguine view. Questions of national security political manipulation, in particular the fear of terrorism, often conflated with the fear of unauthorised arrivals of immigrants, asylum seekers and refugees, even a confected fear of Islam itself, have shielded government measures from political challenge or rigorous scrutiny. It's become almost a taboo subject, creating a vacuum of silence in the absence of strong leadership. Well, I suggest that the justifications for tolerating a wide defence power, especially the alleged need to respond urgently, are often specious, as the logics for such deployment take many months. Most particularly, unilateral decision-making fails to raise or to answer the very important questions. 
How is it that this most crucial decision to engage in international conflicts should be made without the safeguards of contemporary democracy, of transparency, access to accurate information, public debate, and compliance with the rule of law? What national interests are being served by international military engagement? Are Australia's international obligations under the United Nations Charter being observed? Will the military engagement comply with international humanitarian laws, especially where bombing campaigns indiscriminately <coughs> kill predominantly civilians? What are the expected outcomes of the military deployment and how will these be assessed? What are the time limits and how to, is it possible to control the slippery slope of lengthy engagement? What programs are in place to deal with the aftermath of conflict, to rebuild the damaged civil society and to ensure good governance and the rule of law? Well, it's long recognised as a cliché that the first casualty of war is truth. But only last year did the Oxford Dictionary include the term post-truth as the word of the year. <laughs> the idea that there are alternative facts and that they too have credibility has created an Alice in Wonderland world where words mean what we choose them to mean or as George Orwell so wisely wrote in 1984, what the party says is truth is truth. All this might be of interest only to scholars or to close political observers were it not for the dangerous times in which we live and the severe human, predominantly civilian cost of all military deployments. We've seen the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria renewed US commitment to the conflict in Afghanistan. We've seen the rise of homegrown terrorists in the United States, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, and in Australia. In the Asian region, we've seen threats to stability over the South China Sea, the brutality of treatment of the Rohingya from Myanmar, with UN officials now fearing crimes against humanity. And we've seen the missile launches and threats by North Korea and concerns about Muslim or terrorist insurgencies in Mindanao. Compounding this dangerous cocktail of instability is the phenomenon of weak and inexperienced global and national leadership. We watch with horror as the traditional language of diplomacy, restraint, and the international rule of law at the United Nations <coughs> has been replaced by the United States President's use of the language of brute force and threats of total destruction. <coughs> While well, being invited to take part in this International Day of Peace, I'm reminded of my own disillusionment at the decision of the Howard government to join the Coalition for Winning of Iraq in Iraq in 2003. My concern at the time was less the failure to have credible evidence that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction. For how could I possibly judge or know? But rather, it was the cynical and opportunistic disregard for international law and the processes of the United Nations Security Council that prompted my public condemnation of Australia's contribution to the war. Indeed, I, I, looking back and, and thinking about this, uh, what I was going to say tonight, looking back, I, I remember how extraordinary it was for me, although I was at university in the 60s and marched behind uh, Jim Cairns in the moratorium marches in Melbourne down to Treasury Gardens and listened to him speak, um, I didn't really know what it was all about. Uh, but by the time we came to the, uh, the second war uh, in uh, the, co the coalition of willing in Iraq in 2003, um, I really did have some expertise in international law. And I found myself doing something which uh, I shudder to think about now, standing on the steps of the Supreme Court um, of Victoria with a microphone in my hand, uh, talking about the uh, failure to abide by well-established principles of the United Nations. So it certainly has brought back some of those memories, um, and who could have known at the time the disastrous global and regional consequences of that illegal intervention, but it had, at that time, cemented my commitment to an international rules-based regime to prohibit the use of force and to manage conflict. International law has informed my entire legal career. As a young law student, I was inspired by the aspirations of the Covenant of the League of Nations, after World War I, the war to end all wars, and the Charter of the United Nations after World War II to employ the law to regulate and, if possible, to prohibit or limit war and conflict in all its forms. I was so stimulated and excited by the work 
that Doc Evatt did in the United Nations uh, in drafting the Charter in part and accepting the invitation of Eleanor Roosevelt uh, to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Um, it's perhaps not always remembered what a remarkable man uh, Doc Evatt was on these questions with extraordinary vision and foresight. Um, and he was, of course, the president of the General Assembly when the Universal Declaration uh, passed without a single negative vote in 1948. His sheer force of personality, brilliance as a lawyer, and absolute determination that this uh, doc document should be uh, the platform for the development of all modern international human rights law uh, is really quite remarkable and often forgotten, and sadly, I think, now betrayed. Well, Australia has been a party, of course, to the UN Charter since 1945, and its preamble says that the UN was established to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. The armed force shall not be used, save in the, com uh, in the, in the common interest. <clears throat> Under the framework of international law, the use of force was for the first time fully prohibited. The Charter provides that all nations shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. That cardinal principle has only two exceptions. Nations can go to war where this is authorised by the Security Council or where there is an act of self-defence. So it was in light of these clear and agreed rules um, uh, that it was astonishing for me that the federal politicians, lawyers, diplomats and civil servants could at the time of the Iraq invasion argue what I knew to be categorically legally wrong. In essence, and you might remember all of these detailed arguments, the argument made was that Security Council Resol Resolution 678 gave the UN members an implied right to use all necessary means to restore international peace and security in Kuwait. It was alleged that that uh, resolution was re revived 12 years later on the alleged material breach of another resolution, 687, by Iraq of a ceasefire resolution in 2002. The argument was completely fallacious. There is no implied right, and there was no way that a resolution in relation to Kuwait could be revived 12 years later to justify military action in Iraq. There was no right of individual state action. The Security Council was properly seized of the matter, and it alone was empowered to take action. Well, I think you all know the outcome, and you'll also uh, be aware of the Chilcot Inquiry in 2016. Uh, the Chilcot Inquiry took seven years to complete, and it looked, of course, at British conduct uh, of the war in Iraq. And it made some very important findings that the coalition of the willing was based on tenuous evidence, some of which um, proved to be pure fabrication. The British government had ignored contrary evidence or had downplayed any contrary evidence. Intelligence was gathered by the agencies with the aim of supporting the already agreed political policy view rather than providing an objective assessment of the threats to peace and security. And the Attorney General uh, then, uh, Lord Goldsmith, was persuaded, as you will all remember quite dramatically, to modify his original legal opinion after making a visit to the United States State Department. Well, Australia, to our shame, um, was provided with extremely poor legal advice by the Department of Foreign Affairs lawyers, advice that largely mirrored that of Lord Goldsmith, which in turn mirrored the views of the United States government. Um, little attempt was made by our senior civil servants to provide fearless advice to the government but maybe they learned from the experience of Lord Goldsmith. Well, since 2003, over those 14 years, I've learned many lessons. And one is the failure by Australia to implement its international obligations in our national laws, so that Parliament and the courts have been able to discount international law in favour of the Constitution and the unambiguous and clear language of legislation. And we find that point made over and over again. Uh, perhaps don't need to remind you that we are the only democratic country in the world that does not have a Bill of Rights. We are the only common law country in the world that does not have a Bill of Rights. We do not have the constitutional protections that would uh, provide guidance to the court or even to Parliament. Uh, this has led to the relative isolation and exceptionalism of Australia with respect to human rights 
to the mass movements of peoples and refugees, and even to global environmental challenges. But the other lesson, and it's a, and it's a, a broad one, has been as a consequence of the growing isolation of Australia from jurisprudence, an increasing expansion, as I've said, of executive discretionary power. So that when I come to the question of war powers, I tend to see this issue within the much broader canvas of encroaching, overreaching power of the executive and ministerial discretion that is not for practical purposes subject to judicial review as being one of the greatest dangers to our contemporary, uh, contemporary democracy. Um, and it's for those reasons, and I've thought quite a lot about this, is that I've come to the view that we do need to strengthen the role of Parliament in a stronger advisory role, particularly through its uh, committee processes. Uh, we need a broadening of the role of Parliament, um, and I should have thought uh, uh, some form of inquiry into Australia's role in Iraq, although that clearly is fallen on deaf ears. Just very briefly, Australia's constitution vests the power of decision making with the Queen in conference with the Governor General, who in turn acts on the advice of the Prime Minister and the Federal Executive Council, comprising all the ministers and parliamentary secretaries. The constitution provides an executive power to make decisions for the execution and maintenance of the constitution, and the executive power can, however, be limited and regulated by Parliament, because Parliament is specifically given the legislative power to make laws with respect to naval and military defence of the Commonwealth and control of the forces. And indeed, the High Court, Justice Isaacs in Ferry and Burnett, has particularly emphasised the importance of Parliament in advising the executive on the use of the defence power. But in recommending a stronger parliamentary role in any decision to use military force internationally, I do so with some profound reluctance. That is because the current parliamentary committee system is very weak and often ineffectual. The respective committees all too frequently vote along party political lines, thereby reducing the credibility and power of their reports. The recent work of the Human Rights Scrutiny Committee and the Security and Intelligence Committees are disappointing examples. Moreover, even a considered report will often be ignored during the debate on a bill on the House, the floor of the House, or lost in the deal making with independent senators. It's also true that Parliament itself has been weakened over, over recent years, and there's been a tendency for oppositions, particularly with regard to anything labelled as, uh, as terrorism or national security, a tendency for Parliament not to engage in any kind of really rigorous scrutiny of measures that are being proposed by the government of the day. So that the role of opposition within Parliament does seem to me to have been significantly weakened in an attempt to uh, ensure that there's no daylight between the government in power and the opposition on issues of um, national security and, and terrorism. But with all of these defects, which I believe to be true, there's nonetheless a phenomenon, I think, in Australia that we have a strong preference for parliamentary decision-making above judicial supervision. Now, I have no difficulty with, um, with the concept of judicial supervision. Um, that's how Europe, North America, New Zealand, Canada operate, where they have bills of rights and constitutional provisions which provide benchmarks for judicial control over the executive. Um, but that is not working in Australia, and at, at, a, at a political level, I have to accept uh, that we're not really going to, there's no, almost no political support, for example, for a Bill of Rights in Australia. Um, it is curious, given that I've said we have a preference for parliamentary decision making, that we have the l lamentable exception of the postal vote on marriage equality, but putting that to one side, we do seem to have a political preference to work within the parliamentary system. And that is why I suggest uh, that we do need to strengthen some form of advisory and consultative rights of a parliamentary committee. Um, it may be that we could go so far as to ensure that any decision to go to war should be made by a joint sitting of both houses to allow the government to gain the outcome it wishes with its greater majority in the lower house, likely offsetting its deficit in the Senate. While the Prime Minister's war powers will be subjected to new checks and balances and greater deliberation, it would, in most cases, still enable the government to determine the course for which it ultimately will have to answer at the ballot box. Well, I believe 
that we should have had an inquiry into our uh, engagement with the coalition of the willing. Uh, we should have been able to learn from that experience, as indeed uh, the British have done. Um, but at least we should not forget the events of 2003. And I really do uh, support the, 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 this initiative uh, and, the, and the discussion for reform of these powers, because I think it's time that we looked at an evolving trend amongst comparable legal systems to engage Parliament more closely, not necessarily with um, a decision-making power, although I think that would be preferable, but at least to engage in a public discussion about the need for a more contemporary approach to public discussion and query about the resort to military uh, engagement uh, in particularly, of course, as we're likely to see it more within our own region. Um, these are very dangerous times, and I think it's important that we remember both the principles that Doc Ellick fought for, uh, the principles indeed that I think we fought two wars for, uh, should be upheld and respected uh, rather than uh, ignored as they typically are within Parliament and by our parliamentary leaders. So um, I very much look forward to the following discussion, and thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian. Paul. Thanks very much, John, and thanks very much, Gillian. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. In this evening's presentation, I want to propose to you the decisions to deploy the Australian Defence Force into an international armed conflict should be made by the Australian Parliament. One, because it's the right thing to do, and two, because it's a perfectly practical thing to do. I'll then outline some models of parliamentary involvement and conclude by outlining how you can help and why your voice is important. Our politicians routinely intone that going to war is the gravest decision a government can ever has to take. But in fact, they leap into it with poorly concealed enthusiasm because it is so often politically adva advantageous for them to do so. To tell us that we're in danger and that they're going to save us by assisting our great and powerful ally. And in this country, it, as you've heard, it is far too easy to do in a procedural sense. The arrangements we have in this country are a legacy of the ancient prerogatives of the sovereign. As sovereigns over the centuries, and British sovereigns in particular are the most relevant, relinquished their powers to Parliament, they held back the power to declare war because until fairly recently we were subjects rather than citizens and the, power, the, the decision about which countries, will, which other sovereigns I'll go off and fight remained with, with the sovereign. When Australia became uh, a federation in 1901, we got something closer to home rule than to independence, until we, in the, the early 1940s, we ratified the Statute of Westminster. So once, once Australians moved outside the, the continental boundaries of Australia, we were subject to British law and our passport said we were British subjects. And so when Bob Menzies uh, went on the wilds in 1939 and said, it's my melancholy duty to inform you that, uh, that out of dark Britain is at war, and therefore Australia is at war, he was perfectly correct. The King had declared war, and because of our constitutional arrangements, we were automatically at war. 1940, at the end of 1941, Japan ended the war and we got into a fairly sharp exchange with the UK government about whether the 9th Division should be in North Africa defeating Hitler or back here defending Australia from Japan. Uh, so it suddenly became a very important matter who decided where Australian forces would be and we arranged for the King to delegate the power, as Julian has told me, delegate the power uh, to declare war to the Governor-General and no it was delegated to the Governor General. And, and we were very careful in those days, we were, we were meticulous about the legalities. We declared war again. The Governor General declared war. Just to be quite sure that the power having been delegated, uh, the declarations hadn't lapsed. And we backdated those declarations to 1939 in the case of uh, 
of, of Germany and Italy, and we, then we declared war on various other countries. And uh, nice qu question for trivia night. What's the, what's the last country in which we ever declared war? Thailand. In fact, July 1942, because Thailand avoided a Japanese occupation by being, a, uh, in, in effect, an ally of Japan. So there we have it, the Governor General uh, declares war, which means uh, the, on the advice of the Executive Government. So effectively, the power to declare war rests with the Prime Minister alone. Because while we have cabinet government, the, government the, the cabinet is convened by the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister need only convene cabinet for purposes that suit the Prime Minister and need only put on the cabinet agenda matters that the Prime Minister wants the cabinet to discuss. And when we invaded Iraq, as Hugh White wrote later, uh, uh, the discussion never went to, is it a good idea, the participation in, in, in the discussion in the National Security Committee of Cabinet never went to, is this a good idea? Uh, about that, Hugh White wrote, they didn't ask us and we didn't tell them. Uh, it just went simply to what the Prime Minister wanted to discuss, which was the modalities. So, our political leaders from either party cling to those ancient prerogatives of the, of, of the sovereign and reserve to themselves the power to, to dispatch the men and women of the Australian Defence Force into international armed conflict. And this is a very tempting morsel for people whose motivation for entering politics and clawing their way to the top is the exercise of power. What could be a more heady exercise of power than committing the ADF to battle? And the framers of the US Constitution understood this well. The Constitution supposes, wrote James Madison, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to use it. It has accordingly with studied care vested the question of war in the legislature. Thomas Jefferson wrote of his desire never to keep an unnecessary soldier. He acted on this belief when he became president, cutting the young nation's standing army by a third, and he later warned Congress against raising armies whenever a speck of war is visible on the horizon. Now the comfortable convention is that democracies are inherently peace-loving, but they only take military action in response to emerging threats to their security. If that were so, intelligence agencies would play a critical role in decisions about war and peace. They would be the ones that discern the emerging threats and bring them to the attention of the policy makers. In response to this, the policy makers would consider the full range of available diplomatic and military responses and decide what to do about the emerging threats. This is certainly the way professional analysts in intelligence agencies and most senior military leaders think it ought to be. Unfortunately, the reverse is usually the case. As the events leading up to the Iraq war demonstrated all too clearly, the policy is more likely to shape the intelligence than the intelligence is to shape the policy. The brutal reality is that politicians only look to intelligence agencies to produce evidence in support of their decisions and then at a later time to assist with the, the conduct of military operations. They want the intelligence agencies to help them sell the war, but certainly don't look to them for advice as to whether or not military action is the appropriate course, or even for advice about the facts on the ground in the country in question, unless those facts on the ground happen to help mark the chosen course of action. And, and the senior desk officer in the, uh, in the, in the CIA, uh, responsible for that area, uh, Paul Pillar, has written subsequently that the, that the weight of advice from US intelligence agencies was A, don't do it, and B, if you are going to do it, be prepared for a messy aftermath. Now the situation is compounded in Australia by the iconic status of the ANZUS Treaty, which modern politicians from both sides of politics has presented have presented as meaning far more than its terms require. Those terms being simply a requirement to consult in the event of a threat to the territorial in independence, political integrity or security of either party, after which each would proceed in accordance with its own constitutional processes. There is no treaty requirement per se for Australia to follow the United States to war, 
Conversely, there is no treaty requirement for the United States to come to our aid if we are threatened. However, in three of our major post-World War II deployments, Vietnam, Afghanistan and Iraq, the government of the day has seen party political advantage in exploiting the claimed special relationship with the United States and in making appeals to patriotism. In none of these cases did the government conduct a close examination of the rationale for military action or the desired end state of the mission. We just assumed that the United States knew what it was doing and went along for the ride. There was no careful reflection about the aim of the exercise, no consultation with Australian senior military or senior defence and foreign policy officials, little of any consideration of the prospects of success or even of what success would look like. And apparently no thought given to the possibility that the US was selling us a dubious package, a dubious package to us and to its own public. So we're now in a situation where, as has been made clear by uh, previous speaker, we, we no longer respect the UN Charter, which provides that war is a last resort and there are only two available grounds for military action. I might say also we've ceased to submit deployments to the Governor General. Uh, the deployment now, uh, it's certainly in the case of Iraq, and it seems all subsequent deployments are a matter of the Defence Minister issuing an instruction under Section 8 of the Defence Act to the Defence Department, to, to the Defence Force to deploy. Now, Section 8 of the Defence Act comes under the heading Administration. And, it's, and it's, it, it simply states that uh, the Minister is in charge of the, the Department and the Defence Force and the CDF and the Secretary are responsible for the Minister. It was never intended, and it was expressly stated in the second reading speech in 1975, that this was not a power to declare war, declare war and had no impact on the prerogatives of the Governor General. So we deserve better than this. This is, this is no way to manage the affairs of one of the oldest and most mature democracies in the world. And reforms are needed. I, I, I said if, that shifting the war powers to Parliament was the right thing to do. Two reasons for that. One, we live in a representative democracy. The current postal quote survey, unquote, notwithstanding, we elect ro local representatives and send them off to Parliament to make decisions on our collective behalf. This most grave of decisions should be made by our elected representatives. Secondly, as I've described, the current situation is a legacy of monarchical times when we were all subjects of the sovereign, the sovereign decided when and where we went to war. It's long been a principle of our society that power flows from the people to the executive rather than the reverse, and it's extraordinary to see political leaders who loudly profess their republican values clinging to the ancient prerogatives of the sovereign. Now there are four points that are usually trotted out in rebuttal of my proposition that Parliament should decide. The first of them is, oh, but we'll get held up by the minor parties in the Senate. If the government can persuade the opposition that the nation really is under threat. The, the minor parties in the Senate become irrelevant. So this sounds to me like an objection, like, like uh, an objection that it will limit the opportunity to engage in wars of choice. Well, yes, that is the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, it will take too long. Well, a very large, a very small amount of the Australian Defence Force is held in a high state of readiness. We have the Ready Reaction Force in Townsville. Uh, it, it is the capacity to inject a battalion of infantry, basically, into a police type action and sustain that operation for weeks or months. Uh, and uh, so, uh, trouble in a Pacific Island, we could, at the request of a Pacific Island government, deploy a battalion in In 19, as, as, as John has indicated, I, I, with my then colleague Admiral Barry, we recommended in February 1999, see, seeing trouble down the road with the uh, plebiscite in East Timor, recommended to the government that they raise a brigade group to 28 days 
readiness. That means that they're at a point where you, if you gave them 28 days notice to move, they could actually move. Uh, that point was reached in September, seven months later, and it cost, from memory, something like $297 million. So it, 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 it's perfectly sensible not to maintain the ADF in a high rate of data readiness because it is damn expensive to do so. Uh, and so the need for a parliamentary debate is not, is not the, uh, the, the, the thing that would uh, operate on the, political, on the critical path. And I might say, if you're talking about sending people to war, maybe it would be worth recalling Parliament if you really needed to. <laughs> the third one is, government might have access to secret information it can't share. Well, I'm amazed that people can still advance that argument with a straight face <laughs> after 2003. But there's a, there's, a more, there's a deeper point here, and that is we live in a Westminster democracy. It only requires the government to lose the confidence of the House. And we might go to another election, but as we saw in 1975, the Governor-General could simply swear in the opposition uh, as, the, uh, as the new government. Uh, and so today's opposition could become tomorrow's government, and therefore to argue that you can't brief them on matters of national security is rubbish. And uh, when we started to engage in bombing operations in Syria, Julie Bishop was very proudly proclaiming that she had briefed the opposition. So we do brief the opposition, and we must insist that the opposition can be kept abreast of these matters. Now, I would be the first to agree that there, there would be matters that can't be uh, tabled in the Parliament, that there, there would be intelligence information that can't be tabled in the Parliament. But I also say there's a, there's a, there's a sort of 80-20 principle in the intelligence world, and that is if you can't see most of the story from open sources, you would start to wonder whether you are the victim of a, uh, of a, of a disinformation campaign. And I would, I would imagine that most of the time, the government of the day can point to open source material or relatively non-sensitive material to say, this is the picture we see emerging, this is the threat we see emerging, and by the way, uh, this is confirmed by the intelligence sources and that's been shared with, with the opposition. So, there is a way around that issue and, and it is offensive to the Westminster system in principle. And the fourth one is, oh, but they'll just vote on party lines. Well, that may be the case. It's certainly what you would expect to see in the current situation where, at best, the National Security of Cabinet makes the decision because then the, 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 the backbenchers can fall back and say, oh, geez, mate, what could I do? I mean, the decision's already made. My job now is to support the men and women of the ADF and the decision that the country's made. We can't undermine morale by saying we shouldn't be going to war. I just... My own personal feeling is that people, if people had to stand up and be counted about whether they thought going to this war was a good idea, I just question whether you would get a straight vote on party lines. That might be what the major parties are afraid of in opening this up to parliamentary, parliamentary decision. Uh, remember Hillary Clinton in 2003 voted for the war in Iraq, and I think she voted for it because she thought that was, with her presidential aspirations, that, would, that, that was the the position that was in her personal political interest to take. Now, it didn't quite turn out according to plan, and Hillary's been explaining ever since why she voted for, or been asked to explain, she now actually has explained, why she voted for the invasion of Iraq. And I think, uh, I think a lot of members of Parliament would, would think pretty hard about what they wanted history to record, if history was going to record what their stance was at the time. So anyway, those four, those four categories of objection, to my mind, are just excuses. When Scott Ludlam introduced his bill in 2009, the bill was referred, was referred off to a committee. The committee didn't have hearings. Ludlam had 
some meetings. They never had the benefit of parliamentary privilege. They were never official meetings, uh, 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 hearings of the parliament. It was just lovely and talking to people like me who put in submissions in support of this legislation. Uh, but if the will were there, if, 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 if the political will were there to involve parliament in the decision making, it is not beyond the capacities of our legislators to frame legislation. Uh, there, there are practical issues to be considered. It is not beyond our legislators to frame legislation which is workable, sensible work. I, I'll give you an example of a... Okay, get close. Uh, I, I'll give you an example of, of the sort of thing you might think about. I, I for one, would be prepared to settle for, for a, a, a situation in which it was a prerogative of the executive to deploy the Ready Reaction Force. It's called it's called back for a purpose, and uh, you could say, okay, you can if there's something that needs an instantaneous response, you can deploy the Ready Reaction Force and table a statement in Parliament within 22 hours to be debated as to why you did it. Okay, so what are the potential models? I would, I would say I'd be satisfied uh, at least as the first step with anything from where the UK is now, where it's simply a, a, a debate and a vote in, in, the, in the lower house is required, to something which would be my ideal model, my preferred model would be <coughs> we have a standing committee of parliament which operates under arrangements which enable it to receive and consider classified briefings. Before any deployment, a report by that committee is tabled in each house. We also have the tabling of an opinion by the Attorney General or Solicitor General on the legality of the proposed military operation, and this enabled, enabled a fully informed decision to be taken by either House. Now, how can you help? I'd like to suggest a couple of things. Write to your Member of Parliament or Senator, and you might say, well, what good will that do? Well, I'll tell you what good it'll do. I, I write letters to people like the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister and the Foreign Minister and what have you. But we sooner or later become the usual suspects, you know, they, they get letters from us that are and that. And when you engage with them, they say, oh, it's all very well, mate, but, you know, I mean, no one ever raises it. When you write to your, when you write to your local member, I'll tell you what will happen next. Your local member will have to send somebody around to the Defence Minister's office and say, how should I reply to this letter? <laughs> and the Defence Minister will say, oh, well, here's a boilerplate response. That's all fine. But you write, and you write, and you write from different electorates. And there are people trotting around saying, how should I respond to this letter? And, and they become aware that this is becoming a public issue rather than a sort of arcane issue that's raised by... Uh, uh, yesterday's men, you know, uh, time expired public <coughs> Remember, John Howard said in 2003 when 43 of us signed a letter saying this is a seriously bad idea. Ah, oh, but that was, that, that, those people all retired before 9 11. The world's different now. They don't, they don't know how it works anymore. Well, I don't repent of saying it was a bad idea. Um, so you can write to your MP. You can put your name down to receive our bulletins and there's uh, a form up the back that you can sign and we'll send you the bulletin. And you can, if you really want to, you can join our organisation and, and help us to, uh, to fight the good fight. Uh, that's enough from me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, we now have uh, Kelly to speak to us, and uh, then we'll have uh, Q&A. We probably will wrap up by around 8 o'clock, just before 8 o'clock. Kelly, welcome. I'd like to thank the Australian uh, Association for Public Relations for War Powers Report, the Sydney Democracy Network, and Dr. Sue Barron for the invitation to be a part of tonight's discussion. The late American historian and social activist, Howard Zinn, warned us that when governments kill in large numbers, they always do so for a good reason. We must be on guard against that. 
I'm particularly on guard when it comes to Australia's military incursions, and like you, I care about what's going on in the world, and at some point in your life, you have to decide what responsibility you have to do. When I started writing opinion pieces on various issues many years ago, it quickly became clear to me that vigorous debate in Australia is encouraged only within the limits imposed by unstated doctrinal orthodoxy, particularly in relation to foreign policy. People who control what we know today are determining our future. The historical record is vital to understanding our time, but difficult to access if it even exists. So I decided to focus on government documents to tease out the omissions and the backstories. When information comes from the inside, there are fewer gaps and the government can't deny it. It has to deal with it. When information doesn't come from the inside, you rely on inference and supposition from the outside to fill in the gaps and then it's easy for the power holder to hold and, and, and deny and to ridicule uh, your conclusions. Tonight, please allow me to focus on the issue of Syria with a bit of a plot of history and my FOI work in relation to it. It seems to me to be a contemporary illustration of Australian historian Chris Clark's conclusions in his book, Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. That great powers had more than one enemy, that there was a chaotic quality of decision-making by executive structures, and that the war was a consequence of decisions made in many places, with their effect being cumulative and interactive, decisions made by a gallery of actors who shared a fundamentally similar political culture. It was, and in Syria now is, genuinely complex and multipolar. On the 9th of September 2015, the permanent representative to Australia, of Australia, I should say, to the United Nations, Gillian Bird, wrote to the President of the United Nations Security Council claiming that Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations recognises the inherent right of the states to act in individual or collective self-defence where an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. States must be able to act in self-defence when the government of the state where the threat is located is unwilling or unable to prevent attacks originating from its territory. She alleged that the government of Syria had by its failure to constrain attacks upon Iraqi territory originating from ISIL bases within Syria, demonstrated that it was unwilling or unable to prevent those attacks. The government was not questioned about how Syria was unwilling or unable to prevent those attacks. It was not asked how many airstrikes or how any airstrikes would affect the Syrian population and infrastructure. There was no link between IS, a non-state actor, and Syria as it was not acting under instructions from or the direction or control of the Syrian government. There was no attempt by Western governments to work with the morally disgraceful Assad regime to actually enable it to prevent the attacks emanating from its territory. And indeed, Australia didn't recognise the legit legitimacy of the Assad regime. There was no invitation from the Syrian government for us to carry out airstrikes in Syria. There was no UN Security Council resolution authorising the use of force. There was no proper explanation provided by the government or the opposition about why in August 2015 there was no clear legal basis for Australian involvement in Syria, but by September 2015, a month later, there was. There was no rational discussion about the strategic ends, and there was certainly no mention of the fact that in 2014, we already had ADF embedded personnel, in personnel in Florida contributing to the execution of operations against IS in Syria. There was, however, a letter dated 17 September 2015 from the government of Syria to the United Nations Security Council, which was not reported in the mainstream media, but a copy of which was in the documents I received. It disputed Australia's unwilling and unable claims and pointed out that the Syrian Arab army had, over a period of four years, been fighting IS, the al Nusra Front, and others who were being supported by Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Western states, and called on others to coordinate with them. It went on to say that the international coalition, led by America, had yet to achieve anything tangible in its war on terrorist organisations. And the Syrian government had a point 
particularly when the former President of the United States, Barack Obama, had already told Vice News on camera in March 2015 that ISIL is a direct outgrowth of al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion in 2003, which is an example of unintended consequences. But what were the conditions of the choices to join airstrikes in Syria? What did the government know, or at least what should it have known? These are the omissions, and what was really going on are the backstory. The public via the government and the media were made aware before September 2015 that 15 boys were detained and tortured for having written graffiti in support of the Arab Spring, that pro-democracy demonstrations had erupted in Syria, demanding Assad's resignation, that the Assad government was accused of using chemical weapons in August 2013, that we rejected the presidential election in 2014, that a terrorist state could emerge if IS consolidated its gains in Iraq from its base in Syria, that Syria was the worst humanitarian crisis facing the world at that time, that there were multiple conflicts involving different players, including the Assad regime and numerous rebel groups, with different objectives and different regional and international values, and that a political solution was needed. In the second half of 2014, the Australian government was rightly swept up in the global concern for the Yazidi civilians trapped on Mount Sinjar to escape ISIS. Remembering that we helped to create ISIS courtesy of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The public were told that the RAAF would be dropping aid to the Yazidis, that we would be delivering rocket propelled grenades, mortars and various calibers of ammunition from Eastern European countries to the Kurdish Peshmerga fighters in northern Iraq to combat the spread of ISIS on the back of an assurance provided to the Americans that the weapons would be used by the Peshmerga forces of the Kurdish regional government. The ADF chief Mark Finfin said, the greater risk here is actually doing nothing. We began airstrikes in Iraq in October 2014. One wonders what the Yazidis would now make of our politicians' public displays of outrage and concern about their plight when so many Yazidis remain on Mount Sinjar, where they fled. Women and children are still being held captive from brutal sexual slavery, and to date, there have been no known large-scale rescue missions to free them. Sinjar town remains in ruins, and a new wave of fighting for Sinjar district is underway between the Pejnoga and other Kurdish armed groups. In keeping with the doctrine of cold violence, Defence Air Task Group statistics you can find online confirm that no humanitarian aid deliveries have been dropped since 2014. And only 3,532 people of the promised 12,000 persecuted minorities have been resettled in Australia with an aid budget that has been cut to its lowest level in the nation's history. What was omitted from the political and public discourse in the lead up to our decision to become involved in Syria? was the fact that Syria had experienced a severe drought between 2007 and 2010, spurring as many as 1.5 million people to migrate from the countryside into the cities and creating social and economic tensions. In 2012, the MI6 had cooperated with the CIA on a rat line of arms transfers from Libyan stockpiles to the Syrian rebels after the fall of the Gaddafi regime. <clears throat> that same year, Russia proposed that Assad could step down as part of a peace deal, but the US, Britain and France were so convinced that the Syrian dictator would, would fall, they completely ignored the proposal. At that stage, the United Nations Human Rights Office had confirmed that 60,000 had, had been killed in Syria between March 2011 and November 2012, and the latest estimate, I think, is probably about half a million. In September 2014, the US Congress determined that the 500 million CIA program to arm Syrian rebels had failed, with arms ending up in the hands of the Al Nusra Front and Jordanian intelligence officers selling arms on the black market. The following month, a CIA report concluded that, quote, many past attempts by the agency to arm foreign forces covertly had a minimal impact on the long-term outcome of a conflict, close quotes. 
This report came a month after Australia had delivered weapons to Kurdish Peshmerga fighters and a month before our successful delivery of 40,000 pounds of crated weapons from Albania to Erbil in Iraq. <coughs> in March 2015, 21 international aid agencies and human rights groups released their report failing Syria, which found that the United Nations Security Council powers had failed to alleviate the suffering of civilians as the conflict intensified. Two months later, the International Crisis Group released its report, warning that military aid had been given without an underlying strategy, which would prolong the battle with IS, as well as inflaming other local conflicts between intra-Kurdish rivals. The report also noted that the US-led coalition had remained silent about Kurdish land grabs in disputed territories. It's also worth noting that in May this year, Amnesty International urged the US and other countries to stop arms transfers that could fuel atrocities after a US D Department of Defense audit confirmed that the US Army had failed to monitor over $1 billion worth of arms and other military equipment transfers to Kuwait and Iraq, which ended up in the hands of ISIS. In August 2015, rumors started to emerge that the then Prime Minister Tony Abbott had pushed for the US request to join airstrikes in Syria. Five days before the bipartisan decision was made, Amnesty International had reported that 220,000 people had been killed in Syria, 12.8 million were in need of humanitarian assistance inside the country, and 50% of the population had been displaced. Still, at a reported cost of $500 million a year for our air war against IS, and regardless of international law, we were first in with the United States, beating our British counterparts, who had delayed plans for a parliamentary vote. <coughs> a number of military st strategists were of the view that our involvement was a show for the domestic audience. The irony, of course, is that six days after the, dis the decision was made to conduct airstrikes in Syria, we had a new Prime Minister. And shortly after that, a document titled ADF Operations in the Middle East, produced in response to my freedom of information request, which confirmed that, quote, the prospects for a political or military solution are poor. The use of the word poor seems highly inadequate when looking at Syria under the microscope. You have Saudi Arabia, a Western ally, and Qatar providing clandestine financial and logistical support to IS, Iran and Syria supporting Assad, Turkey fighting the Kurds, US supporting opposition groups but fighting with Russia against IS, drone strikes, bombs being dropped by the United States, Belgium, Jordan, Netherlands, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, Belgium, oh, sorry, I've already said Belgium, France, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Israel, Denmark, and us. The Pentagon, of course, is relying on an army of contractors from military giants, giants to firm fleet to organize crime, to supply arms to Syrian rebels, as well as evidence of the Al Nusra Front having access to sarin gas. And to top it all off, a Bulgarian journalist recently uncovered Abu Bajan, Silkway Airlines offering diplomatic flights to private companies and arms manufacturers from the US, Balkans, Israel, and the militaries of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and US Special Operations Command to ship weapons around the world, including to Syria, without regulation. Mm. Australian politicians talk about ending terrorism, but they make decisions that carelessly or inadvertently stir the pot and radicalise people, which reinforces the public narrative and makes military incursions superficially acceptable. Our politicians continue to support an ally that historically has forsaken the exploration of peaceful means and diplomatic solutions in favour of force and aggression. Under the pretext of decency and force, and they were Tony Abbott's words, humanitarian concerns and the responsibility to protect civilians, we extended airstrikes into Syria. But every war is a war on children. When armed conflicts kill and maim more children than soldiers, and perversely more soldiers die from post-traumatic stress disorder and peacetime incidents than war. War diminishes both justice and truth. And another striking omission from the official historical narrative about 
Syria is the Syrians' demonstration of their capacity to deal with invaders like IS without the shoals of bombs and the murderous crossfire, crossfire of billions of dollars worth of foreign arms. The most graphic example of this, in which I'm aware, occurred in Ashram in 2014, when locals mobilised to defend themselves. They worked together to donate money, distribute weapons, they were cooking and looking after those who were at checkpoints and patrolling the city, and they, were, and they were serving food for free. Once IS was defeated, a locally run reconciliation process commenced. Could there be a clearer demonstration of how to resist an invasion without wholesale destruction involved in bombing the military strategies, and at the same time pave the way for reconciliation as the threat abates? Such a rational approach diffuses rather than escalates violence and allows participants to retain hope for the future and themselves, their families and their social groups, and even their former adversaries are reintegrated into post-conflict society. Returning to the conventional world war, over the Christmas period in 2016, I was drawn to reports by the NGO Air Wars, describing the Australian Defence Force as one of, one of the least transparent military coalition members. The ADF were not prepared to reveal where they bombed, when they bombed, or what they bombed. <coughs> on 6 January 2017, I issued an FOI request on the Department of Defence for copies of documents confirming and or specifying the dates and or locations and the outcomes in terms of the number of military and civilian casualties of airstrikes carried out by Australian forces in Syria, and or describing recording investigations of and assessing the circumstances of Australian involvement in civilian casualty incidents relating to airstrikes in Syria. You have to be very precise when you issue these requests. Uh, on, on 20 January 2017, I received an email simply confirming that, quote, the department does not specifically collect authoritative and therefore accurate data on enemy and or civilian casualties in either Iraq or Syria, and certainly does not track such statistics. In other words, for all the political protestations about concerns about civilian lives, or concern for civilian lives, we were not even trying to count our victims. Today we have only claimed responsibility for the deaths of Syrian soldiers in airstrikes in September 2016. In recent times, the senior British commander, Major General Jones, said in response to criticisms from Amnesty International that the Iraq government and coalition carried out disproportionate and unlawful attacks to take back Mosul, that it is, and this is, this is his quote, it is naive to think a city such as Mosul, with a population of 1.75 million, could be liberated without any civilian casualties while fighting an enemy that lacks all humanity. But that, of course, is what our government would have us believe in relation to our involvement in Iraq and Syria. <coughs> in March this year, a story aired on the ABC 730, which was struck together by Sophie McNeil, um, based in the Middle East, about the findings by Air Wars, in relation to the ADF and the results of my FOI request. On the 1st of May, Human Rights Watch sent a letter to the Minister for Defence, the Minister of Defence, calling for the government to improve the transparency of its operations and strike reporting. And the next day, the ADF announced that it would start to publish fortnightly reports mm -hmm. on airstrikes it carries out in Syria and Iraq. The reports only describe, in general terms, the locations and the targets. So I issued a further FOI request for the GPS coordinates of each target to enable people to accurately uh, cross-reference whether Australian aircraft may have been involved in civilian casualty incidents. And you can understand that that could be problematic given that there are so many players involved and so many bombs being dropped. You need to know which bomb is responsible for which death or the collateral damage. The ADF was not prepared to release that information, it seemed to me that the GPS coordinates became historical data once bombs were dropped, so one wonders whether they were embarrassed about what they've bombed or what collateral damage they've caused. Other Freedom of Information requests they have issued have revealed that we were bombing in the Mosul Jadida neighbourhood on the day that civilians were killed there, although it seems we weren't involved in a particular airstrike. 
and that we had knowledge, although it was um, initially denied, uh, but later confirmed, that we have knowledge of the use of white phosphorus munitions in Iraq and Syria. Against this background, we have evidence of the human toll. A record number of children killed in Syria last year, and toxic stress and mental health issues among children inside Syria. All children surveyed put the ongoing bombing and shelling as the number one cause of psychological stress in their daily lives. 50% of children say they never or really, rarely feel safe at school, and 40% say they don't feel safe to play outside. 71% of children increasingly suffer from frequent bedwetting, large-scale displacement and collective suffering, which was labelled by one doctor as human devastation syndrome. Children not in schools, the streets littered with the remnants of war and the ongoing physical and sexual exploitation of children, many of whom have lost parents and loved ones. Does war ever solve anything? And as if Australia wasn't already an aircraft carrier for the United States, the government decided this year to sell military equipment to Saudi Arabia. Overnight, the Minister for Defence Industry, Christopher Pine, became a dedicated arms salesman by announcing in July that he wants to become a major arms expert exporter on par with Britain, France and Germany and use exports to cement relationships with countries in volatile regions including the Middle East. Perpetual war has decimated the Middle East. Others rightly argue the government that decides that the bulk of its budget is going to go to arms, manufacturing implicitly make a moral decision that militarism is more important than the creation of well-being for the population. This is particularly opposite and, and John touched on this. It's a particularly opposite criticism in the case of US expenditure on armed conflict, including but not limited to the war in, in Syria. The US government's breathtaking expenditure on wars is even more alarming when you understand that it's funded by borrowed money, including US Treasury bonds, purchases by Japan and China, and pension funds. The massive war debt continues to climb with interest liabilities. My point of history hopefully demonstrates the need for far greater historical perspective on foreign conflicts and for more informed and open decision making by governments, including ours, on the question of whether to become involved. Our difficulty is that we aren't told the truth about the background or the decisions to become involved, and the decisions seem to be made in furtherance of unstated international coalition agendas rather than of open and objective assessment of their assessment of their merit. This state of affairs is made profoundly worse by the decision to go to war having become an executive decision rather than a decision made democratically after full and open parliamentary debate based on the best objective information available. Fortunately, we have inspirational leaders like Professor Triggs, whose indomitable courage in the face of baseless criticism and completely unmeritorious political savagery shone like a beacon throughout her term as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. But we can't leave our future our children's future and the future of humanity to others. We must cast aside the spin and the propaganda, rehumanise the victims of war, and roll up our sleeves and dig for and publicise the truth. Indeed, it's the only thing with any chance of prevailing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jillian and to uh, Paul and to Kelly. Uh, I think it's pretty clear from this session so far that we should worry about our children. I found the whole thing uh, dirty, destructive, depressing and dangerous. Um, I, uh, it's half past seven. Um, what we could do is just very briefly, uh, beginning with Gillian, um, a comment or two and then we open it up for uh, for Q&A, and that requires passing the microphone. Gillian, just briefly, any additional comment? Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed both of those uh, presentations, and um, uh, Kerry, in particular, it's always so important to delve into the weeds and to go to all that effort that you have clearly gone to to, to get the truth. Uh, but it does underscore to my concern that we are in a post-truth environment and we live on slogans, most of which are lies, and it takes a great deal of, of energy and courage and determination to keep digging 
The, the great tragedy, however, is that by the time we've discovered the truth, the political issue has moved on. Correct. Um, and, and just, there are lots of examples, of course, but one that I think was so damaging, whether we go from the children overboard uh, lies, that helped lead to a, a hard victory, to the scandalous uh, suggestions against uh, Save the Children in relation to the treatment of uh, families and children on, on Nauru, all of which proved to be lies by subsequent Senate inquiries. The trouble is that the moment has passed, and uh, it's too late, nobody much cares then, it's moved on. And uh, people like us can bemoan the, the, the realities, but, but it hasn't altered policy. And, and so uh, I, I, I fully agree with everything uh, that's been said, but I think we do need a strategy for moving more quickly to push back against the lies and to demand much greater levels of transparency. How we do that, I don't know. I like the, uh, the idea of writing to our MPs, uh, that, that that can be effective. But I think we've, we've actually got to engage mainstream media more and we've got to be speaking up more and more clearly push back against the myths and the lies and the lack of information. Because if we don't speak up immediately, the, the falsity becomes a form of truth and, and very, very hard to, uh, to, to change things a year or two later. Excuse me, John. Paul, oh, yes. This is, um We've got the word democracy there, and we've listened to these speakers for an hour and a half, and there's only a short time for questions, and I really think, uh, even though I, I respect everyone there, I really think you're not keeping to your title, which is War and Democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think you should to switch the questions. We've listened to the speakers, and they've been excellent and fantastic, and even Gillian's question there was there, but I think we should open up the questions. From, from the audience, because there is, believe it or not, there's yes. power here as well as there. Yes. And this is a, you're, you're talking about democracy. Yeah. Well, perhaps our speakers might just no, pass no, the microphone. No, you go straight to <laughs> the this. Yes, that's what I was suggesting. <laughs> Could you say your name, uh, please? There's a roving mic. I was actually trying to create a bridge. For you to collect your thoughts and questions. No, well, we, we don't need that, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> I, I don't get the mic of it very much. Question, question for um, uh, Kelly. Um, when, that, when that issue came up on the 7.30 report, I wrote to that, that um, group in um, Great Britain, I think it is. Uh, the, Air Wars. Air Warfare. Air Wars, yeah. And I, I, I sent him the letter that we sent, that I sent to Maurice Payne. Yes. And then he, then, then I wrote to him another letter briefly after that. And he said that the ADF was now doing the right thing. But what you just said was that they, they're not doing the right thing. They're not telling us the coordinates and the people that they're bombing. Mm. Is that right? Or? Look, I think Chris, um, Chris Woods uh, heads up Air Wars, and I won't speak for him, and I would need to see what he. He, he said, but he is of the view that it's very difficult to, you know, in order to, to get some sort of justice for the families on the ground who are suffering enormously, um, it's very hard to pinpoint um, whose bomb is responsible. Uh, and that's problematic. He was certainly very encouraging uh, of, um, and you have to understand, he is a small, this is a small organisation. Um, with very limited resources. So he was very uh, encouraged and, uh, encouraging and supportive of the fact that we were trying to get the GPS coordinates, which really would isolate where our bombs were landing. Um, the information, you can have a look for yourself. It's, it's under Operation Opera, I think, on the, the Defence website. It, it will give you, it gives very broad details of which country uh, the Defence forces are, are bombing. Um, and it, it'll just say Daesh target, um, you know, operation successful or what have you, no. But it doesn't go, it doesn't delve into any civilian investigations it may be doing, whether that, that be of ISIS fighters or civilians. It just doesn't touch on it. So to my mind, it's inadequate. I think Human Rights Watch were also of that same view, which is why they thought it was a good start, because remember, we went from nothing 
uh, to, to at least being able to recognise where we were bombing, but not getting specific details about what our bombs were responsible for uh, and who we may be killing. And you can imagine a G GPS coordinates, you, you would be able to, to track um, immediately what we were actually responsible for, but for operational security reasons, um, that, that information, they were not prepared to, to release that, that sort of information. There's a question here, thank you. Yes. Could you say your name? I'm Michael Heads, my name. Um, a lot of compelling information. Uh, I think it's just there's three glaring contradictions here. First of all, none of you spoke about what is the driving force behind war. I mean, the United States, you know, emerged from World War II as a predominant imperialist power, is now seeking to maintain and strengthen that domination of the globe by war. War after war after war. And nobody's spoken a word about this reality. And Australian imperialism is completely tied into that uh, automatically by a fine gap and everything else. There's one good choice for going to war. Secondly, none of you have recommended anything more radical or than you know, maybe giving Parliament a consultative voice. I mean, you know, Parliament is a bipartisan war cabal. It has been for a long time. Why give the people a vote? At the very least, a vote, a popular vote, a referendum on war, if you want to be democratic. But thirdly, how did World War I end in the end? It was through a revolution. 1917, October, the Russian Revolution ended World War I. Isn't that what we need again? A revolution? What social force is going to end war? It's going to have to be the, the working class of the world. I'd like you to respond to those three suggestions. Who'd like to have a go? <laughs> Briefly, what was, the, what was the first question in? <laughs> the driving force of war. Well, I think we could debate endlessly what the, the driving force for war is. What, what, what we're trying to do is put a lasso around the, circuit, the, the, the occasions on which we get involved in war. Uh, why not have a referendum? Uh, as I said uh, in, in my presentation, we, we live in a political system in which we elect representatives to, to go up to Parliament and make decisions on our behalf, and I think that's the way we should make decisions to go to war. And uh, the third question was? I don't need a revolution. Well, there are not all that many revolutions that ended terribly happily. The 1917 revolution didn't end all that happily. Well, we uh, invaded after that. That's hmm? part of the problem. Australia helped invade Russia after the revolution. That's, That's right. Part of the problem. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think you could debate uh, what a happy experience the 1917 revolution was. Uh, there's a gentleman here. In the um, yeah, I'm Could you say your name, please? Con Costa. Uh, just to Briefly a question. With one of those last questions. I'm um, sure regulatory change is important and we must become more democratic. I agree with that. But as this previous question has said, we have a bipartisan, maybe tripartisan, no, I'm not sure where the Greens stand, a stand on the US alliance following the US um, imperialist wars, whatever I'm calling. And my concern is that when you get that it actually makes it even look more democratic that we're going to war and even more difficult to oppose it. And so although it would be a game, we have to remember that the United States and Britain do have all those things. They have Bill of Rights, they have parliamentary decisions, and they all go to war at the drop of the hat when imperialism wants to go to war. They just gotta make up the excuse and get the media going. So I'm just I'm not against what the speaker said. I think a lot of correct things and a lot of great information. But I'm just wondering whether regulatory change is the answer. And short of a revolution and stopping imperialist wars, I'm thinking, and I just want to put this out to everybody, that the way to, to stop it is to hold the politicians responsible. We're never going to get ahead of the story. It's always going to come out three or four years later. But the prime example is John Howard got up and said, oh, I'm embarrassed about it, I made a mistake. I'm embarrassed about it, and it was left there. And none of us 
have demanded a Chilcot inquiry. None of us have held them responsible. The current white paper on defence made by Abbott to give 2% of our GDP to the US to continue the wars. We need to hold our politicians responsible, whether it's a year after, to, the information will come out. If these people know, they'll be, held, they'll be shamed, go, they'll go to jail, they hold everyone else they take them for genocide, they commit genocide, or if they want to take Nero position, I will decide, they must know that they will hold all the blame. Yeah, yeah. Why aren't we doing that? Okay, I take this as a... Yes. While you're carrying the microphone, I'd just like to respond to the proposition that none of us have been calling for a Chilcot-type inquiry. We have been doing that constantly uh, since 2012. Mm. Uh, and, and, and John Winston Howard, when he says he's embarrassed, what he's actually, the subtext of what he's saying is, I was misled by the intelligence agencies. I, I acted in good faith on what I knew at the time. He knew from 1998 that the Republicans were going to dislodge Saddam Hussein, and he was part of that uh, five years before the invasion. Well, why can't we hold him okay. responsible? Uh, a question. Thank you so much for your bravery and your honesty this evening. My name is Lucien Barabunyu. Um, two ways forward, please comment if you like. Um, the first way forward I suggest is to seize the narrative. There has to be an alternative narrative and it has to get out there. Um, your network could probably do this. We would all be willing to read it social media. You must seize the narrative today. The information that you presented for us it's incredibly privileged information. I, I mean, I'm just, my hair still standing on end. Uh, and thank you so much, Paul, for putting very complex things very simply for us to understand. It takes a genius to do that. <laughs> um, the second way forward, I was thinking, um, is that at the moment, the bugbear of the government, or one of them, is um, community cohesion in this very successful, supposedly multicultural country of ours. But it is starting to unravel, and it's not just Islamophobia or these mad third generation Muslim kids. They are being radicalized, but they're not mad. There are reasons for this. And if the social fabric of our multicultural society is unraveling, I can never get out of my mind John Howard um, visiting an Australian woman who had the bottoms of her legs blown off in a hospital and she honestly said to him, is one of the reasons that they hate us so much because we've gone to war against them? She had the, uh, in uh, the last bus bombing. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. And he said, of course not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is just take some more questions. Mm, I think we'll, to hear what the audience uh, There's a gentleman in. There's a gentleman in red. A question, please. Yes. Yes. Pushed up. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, question about what sort of inquiry we would need to hold. Uh, is it enough to hold an inquiry into the war uh, reasons, or should we go even further back? Because what uh, Royal this on was 9-11. And without 9 11, you don't have the Iraq war. Without the Iraq war, you don't have the Al Qaeda and the uh, Syria and everything. And given that John Howard was extremely embarrassed, and, and our second speaker also mentioned um, that, uh, uh, that she was, our uh, first speaker mentioned she was very astonished at the war decision, uh, something bizarre and devious is going on here uh, and I'd just like to put my point thank you and ask you, do you think we need an inquiry into 9-11? Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
We've all got good memories taking <laughs> notes. You can deal with that while we're waiting. Um, there's in the front. Thank you. I'd like to thank Julian for her terrific speech and ask her, this is advice we need in Australia's for War Powers Reform. I'm Alison Bernowski, I'm the Vice President. Would we be successful if we somehow managed to find the money and took an action to the High Court, alleging that the Australian uh, deployment in all right, we'll leave out Afghanistan, but certainly Iraq and the wars following uh, were unconstitutional. The, the way in which they were, we were committed, the troops were committed, was unconstitutional. Can a gentleman be behind? Uh, I'm going to take two more. This is one, and there is one here. I'd like to put to you that uh, my name's John Dale, and I've been working uh, against government for the last 20 years and you would be well aware that they do everything possible through the art of the possible to circumvent process and the social contract that they do owe Australian people, all Australian people, they don't deliver. And I think that in stating the case for reform in regard to security and more, to get to the public you're going to need to add this assessment to all the other cases. This would constitute a dynamic presentation to the public so that they can own their own future. At the moment, taking causes one at a time to the Australian voter and the parliamentary system that we have, it can be rigged, it can be circumvented. You could wait. I, I spent... <laughs> Ten years fighting one cause, and I just watched it get frittered away. Could you answer the question of amalgamating your cause so that you, you have a, a dynamic strategy to get to the voting public? And, and there is all the way up the top. We get our runner running. There is... I'm afraid it's the last... I, I do want to ask a question as well, and then the three speakers will reply. Thank you for all the speakers for your contributions. My question is on a little bit of a different tack. Um, do you think government, uh, governments and oppositions who work together to guide us into these wars are able to get away with it now? Because for the last at least 10, probably more years, there's been intensive um, indoctrination of children in schools with the, I don't think this is the word, circusifying, turning Anzac into a circus with pre presenting a very one-sided view of Australia's military history. Um, and, and also with um, encouraging children to join the army, even if only in cadet corps. Anyway, thank you. Could, could, I, um, could I ask the, the speakers to say something about... Um, <laughs> The art of uh, raising hopes um, and the, the, the chances of actually mobilisation. There was a, a question about the need for an alternative narrative. What, what is this narrative? During Vietnam, conscription was part of it. Uh, the church has played a very important role. Um, what? What are the what are the, the chemicals, so to say, that could, could um, galvanise public support for um, the restraint of, of war powers? Might it be? It's a sort of linked question. Might it have something to do? Might an answer come from um, the uniqueness of the times in which we're living? I think all three of you uh, commented that these are dangerous times. How dangerous are they? Um, is it that we're living in times, you know, like the end of the 19th century, where the preparation for war, AJP Taylor, becomes the major cause of the con conflagration, uh, the first great world war? And another little question, China was not mentioned once 
um, there seems to be quite a strong agreement in the room that, as one uh, commenter or speaker, possibly Kelly, no, I'm not sure, Australia is an aircraft carrier for the United States Armed Forces. What about China in um, our geopolitical position? What does it have? What does China, if anything, have to do with this question of war powers and democracy? Could we start with Gillian? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, thank you. I mean, as always, these discussions are always much more interesting when you engage the audience, because you've got perceptions and, and demanding questions that perhaps we haven't really met. Um, so many questions ha have, been, have been raised. Um, there are just two that I'll, that I'll respond to and then others can, can respond. One is um, uh, the, the, the point about the possible appeal to the High Court on constitutional grounds. Um, I think that would almost certainly fail because of the huge uh, um, uh, breadth of the defence power and the way in which the High Court's interpreted it. Um, but I would, I'd be interested to see one mounted in relation, to, in particular, to the, um, the war in Iraq, the coalition for willing, uh, because that was so grossly in breach of our international obligations, that to have that exist on the historical record, if you like, without a challenge in the High Court, I think would be very disappointing. Um, something a little more um, optimistic uh, has been, of course, something that... It, Australia played such a strong role in, and that was the, the um, negotiation of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. And the whole point of that court was to establish individual responsibility for, uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And uh, it's been a great disappointment to me uh, that, that with the hope of that court, it's basically been used against Black Africa. Um, it hasn't been used against the much more serious um, uh, wars that we have supported in various ways uh, in, in the Western environment. Um, I think that Mr. Howard should have been uh, brought to task before the International Criminal Court. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 So the, um, the aspiration of the Rome Statute, uh, where Australia played such a strong role in negotiating it, and ultimately, as uh, you, you might recall, right at the last minute ratifying, but we did it, um, but we've done it in such a way that uh, uh, no one would ever be prosecuted from Australia before that court. They would always be dealt with in domestic law, and of course there have been new prosecutions in domestic law. So it's been extremely disappointing. Um, but I think that ultimately personal responsibility is the is a key to this. Um, and many of you will remember those extraordinary words of the Nuremberg uh, tribunals after the Second World War uh, that crimes against humanity are committed by men not by abstract entities. In other words, it's not only about state responsibility, but it's about each of our individual responsibilities. And that certainly underpins my own approach to the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. We are each responsible for allowing this to continue for as long as it does, and I think we must speak out. I think we, I, as a lawyer, try to work within the system. I haven't really moved to revolution. Um, but I am some sympathetic to the idea that certainly you need an almost catastrophic event for people to uh, move to change and to, to reform powers. And that's, the, that's the, um, the paradox, that you need something dramatic to occur before you can actually achieve change. Um, seizing the narrative, yes, I think we should try harder to seize that narrative. And that's part of what I'm saying about speak up earlier and resist the, the, the alternative facts. There's no such thing as an alternative fact, there's only a fact. Um, and knowing, um, and we've been hearing so many facts dug out in relation to Syria, enormously important work that I'd like to see it out there in the mainstream earlier, yes. uh, much earlier, so that we can yes. respond to it. And, and, and uh, for people to respond with passion. Uh, where has that passion gone? Uh, we now sleepwalk, as I think you used that phrase, we sleepwalk into uh, huge levels of executive power and we're simply oblivious to what is happening. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, I'll make three or four quick points. I want to respond to the gentleman here who said, do we need an inquiry into 9-11? No, we don't. 9-11 had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Uh, an outcome of the very first meeting of, of George W. Bush's National Security Committee of Cabinet uh, in January uh, 2001 was that the Secretary of Defence uh, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff were, were tasked off to uh, 
prepare plans of what an invasion of Iraq would look like. And that makes sense to me, because it directly relates to Iraq. They blamed him. No, yeah, that was part of the marketing of the war. The, 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 the Republicans published an intent to dislodge Saddam Hussein on the Project for a New American Century website in 1998. That was part of the plan. What we need an inquiry into is all the circumstances into how we got involved, including, I would like to know what Dick Cheney discussed with John Howard when he came to Canberra in 1998. Uh, I think Howard was in on it from the start. Second thing, the, ca the counter-narrative. Uh, in, in an environment where uh, our Prime Minister now insists that we are joined at the hip with Donald bloody Trump, uh, I think the counter-narrative we need is, is to educate the Australian public as to what the ANZUS Treaty actually says. Uh, and then go back to what was really the Kim Beasley proposition, a much more self-reliant Australian defence stance in which the United States is an important ally, but we are not simply a fifth arm of the, uh, of the Pentagon. Uh, and um, on the High Court, what I would be interested to see, and we, we don't have time to explore this now, but is a... Is a a challenge to a current deployment on the ground that it had not been authorised by the Governor General. And so, so the, the, it, the, it was not properly authorised. I don't know where that would take us. And last, I'm going to, going to uh, uh, intrude on everyone's patience and say uh, our little organisation is entirely dependent on donations from the public. <laughs> and I hope uh, as you leave, there'll be a couple of people with buckets up the back if you could see your way clear to putting a bit of... Uh, a, 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 bit, a, a bit of loose change or the odd a, a lazy million bucks that you might have in, your back pocket, in, the, in the green bucket, we would be very grateful. Paul got in ahead of me. <laughs> Kelly. I'll just be brief and I'll start out by defending the speakers because we, we really only had 20 minutes to cover all of the issues and some obviously we couldn't touch on in, in the, the time frame but I would say that um, one of the reasons for the FOI work uh, was uh, to... Look, if, you, if I had stood up and made that speech at the time we were making the decision to go to war in, 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 in Syria, I would have been called a conspiracy theorist. Um, you really need the historical inside documents or the reliance of um, whistleblowers to sort of address these issues in real time because an FOI request can take months and months and months, but nonetheless, it's important. And But when that story aired, and I'm so pleased to get some feedback from the audience, when that story aired, I received a, a phone call from, uh, I he will remain nameless, but he, uh, a historian uh, and investigative journalist, and um, he was full of praise, and he said, Kelly, that would have been a fantastic story 20 years ago that would have made the front page um, and he said and I said look and he said to me um, the Department of Defence um, he said let me tell you they accidentally released to me um, the structure of their FOI requests and the channels that, that must be followed uh, and he said this was not sent to you by a low ranking officer it would have been clear at the, the very top levels and I said, so what you're saying to me is that even though it was uh, an absolutely flabbergasting, you know, it was just, look, I was, I'm still in shock with the response um, to the civilian casualties, um, uh, they knew it would sink, it wouldn't go anywhere. Uh, and he said, that's exactly right. But he said, don't, um, he said to me, people give, people care. And I think it's important for you all to know that don't mistake silence for people not caring. Um, it's just that they give uh, 30 seconds of their attention to it uh, in accordance with everything else going on in their life. And what needs to happen with, with decisions about war is a combination of a, a huge number of small acts of, it, of which this is one uh, to become a social movement. I think uh, the, it was the biggest protest in the streets to stop the Iraq war, yes. but uh, I think it was naive although necessary to think that that would stop it. It's something, it's a program, it's a movement, it's, it's resistance, 
Not necessarily revolution, <laughs> because it has to be achievable. You know, you've got to have achievable um, uh, targets, uh, for want of a better word. Um, and uh, but I would encourage you to. You obviously have an interest in this issue, um, and um, you know anything you can do will feed into a bigger movement that will eventually galvanise, because we will have no choice. It, it's I mean it's getting out of hand now. Um, and I would say about China, just very quickly, I think the only thing I touched on was the fact that it's the financier, one of the financiers, uh, which makes no sense to me, but um, uh, I think um, John Hilger uh, released a very important documentary covering the coming war on China. Um, and it's just, it's just hard to know. I think Hugh White thinks Japan's going to be the trigger, if there's going to be a trigger for a World War III. So it's just hard to know where it's going to emanate from. Uh, and um, and that's why you know we have to be on guard. We have to be active. We have to be doing things um, in a coordinated way. That's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, to Gillian and to Paul and and to Kelly, thank you very much, and thank you all for being very patient. I wanted to say that I'm old enough to remember uh, that the last time there was exactly this kind of civic movement uh, that had political effects uh, was uh, the protests that erupted about conscription in Vietnam. And I'm old enough to remember that at the time it seemed, it's one of the paradoxes of civic initiatives, you never know at that point in time and space whether you're going to have effects but that movement, uh, to remind you all, was one that not only produced um, a very important change of government, but within, I think, the space of a few days, uh, conscription was abolished, the announcement was made that troops would be withdrawn from Vietnam, and China was recognized. I think it, I remember it all happened in one week. That was, that was, rapid, that was a rapid reaction, and uh, we don't know whether that can happen again. But um, this was uh, our SDN small contribution to the first uh, public meeting here at the University of Australians for War Powers Reformed. Uh, there are buckets up the back. Um, you could give up to a million, uh, but you know, a little less than that would be welcome. And I just wanted to say that I hope none of you sleep well in your beds tonight. <laughs> Going out this way. There she is.